chapter 7, 8, 9, and 10 was one message that Jeremiah gave. One message from the Lord that he was to give, that he was called upon to give. And so we're going to approach it that way as best as we can. And uh, there are sections we'll move very quickly and other sections where we'll pause for a few moments and, and consider some things. But uh, Lord Jesus, we do invite and ask your spirit to teach us as we study your word. May we hear your word truly in our hearts, Lord. Give us hearts that are open to see and to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. So chapter 7, verse 1. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Stand in the gate of the Lord's house, and proclaim there this word, and say, Hear the word of the Lord, all of you of Judah, who enter by these gates to worship the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Amend your ways and your deeds, and I will let you dwell in this place. Do not trust in deceptive words, saying, This is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. For if you truly amend your ways and your deeds, and if you truly practice justice between a man and his neighbor, you do not oppress the alien, the orphan, or the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place, nor walk after other gods to your own ruin, then I will let you dwell in this place. In the land that I gave to your fathers forever and ever. Behold, you are trusting in deceptive words to no avail. Will you steal, murder, and commit adultery, and swear falsely, and offer sacrifices to Baal, and walk after other gods that you have not known, and then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, We are delivered, that you may do all these abominations. Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your sight? Behold, I, even I have seen it, declares the Lord. But go now to my place, which was in Shiloh, where I made my name dwell at the first, and see what I did to it because of the wickedness of my people Israel. And now because you have done all these things, declares the Lord. And I spoke to you, rising up early and speaking, but you did not hear. And I called to you, but you did not answer. Therefore, I will do to the house which is called by my name, in which you trust, and to the place which I gave you and your forefathers, or your fathers, as I did at Shiloh. I will cast you out of my sight, as I have cast all your brothers out, all the offspring of Ephraim. As for you, do not pray for this people. God says to Jeremiah, And do not lift up, cry or prayer for them, and do not intercede with me, for I do not hear you. This message before us is known as the temple address. In it, the Lord tells Jeremiah to go to the temple and give this entire address from the temple gate, to stand there before the temple. The the location here is critical to the message. And so keep that in mind as we go through it. Jeremiah is going to speak these words now from the temple itself. In front of the temple with the great temple as backdrop. This is still Solomon's temple, not yet destroyed. That massive, beautiful, ornate temple that Solomon had built by the specifications of David received from the Holy Spirit of the living God himself. This amazing edifice that the people of Israel had come to and looked to and sought after for decades, for centuries, their refuge would be found in the temple. This is the same temple where the Spirit of the Lord, the Shekinah of glory of God, filled the temple, where the Ark of the Covenant still stood, a place of massive significance to the Jewish people. And God says, Jeremiah, I want you to speak this message from there because they're getting something wrong, even with my temple. God in this temple address is going to raise the specter of idolatry and set it against the splendor of his majesty. Those are the two back and forth issues that we address, that we see in this message. Idolatry versus majesty. The idols of man versus the maker of man. And the idolatry at hand is not what we might expect. The Lord asks Jeremiah to give this message from the temple because the temple had become an idol. 
The temple of the living God is now the idol of the people. Whatever we worship, whatever we put our trust in, whatever we exalt above the name of the Lord is idolatry. That is our idol. And not only was the kingdom of Judah filled with idolatry, but even the temple itself, even the Levitical sacrifices, the offerings, these had all become idolatrous. Why? Because the people are now putting their faith in the sacrifice rather than in the Lord to whom they were sacrificing. They're putting the edifice of the temple before the power of the Lord. They're saying, in in essence, run to the temple. We'll be safe there. We'll find sanctuary in the temple. That's our safe place. And the Lord is saying, no, I'm your safe place. I'm your sanctuary. Not a structure, not a building made by human hands. And so the temple had become, for the people of Judah, a barrier rather than a meeting place. A barrier to the Lord rather than a place to go to meet with the Lord. And I think that the application here is clear that we fall prey to a similar issue in the church today. And I think we can draw pretty easy parallels, and we will as we go through this. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16. What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So this body becomes His temple. He dwells in this body. Has your body ever become an idol? Do we ever exalt the human body over and above the living God in terms of perhaps our workout regimen or our diet or our use of this body? I'll leave that to you to think through. But beyond even that, the opening verses of this message disturb comfortable Christianity. They go right after it. This message, note this, is not to the whole nation of Judah. Look again at verse 2. Hear the word of the Lord, he says, all you of Judah who enter by these gates to worship the Lord. What are you talking about? Church people. These are people going to temple. These are, these are those who are faithfully heading to the temple, going into the temple for the purpose they think of worship. It's not just the heart of the country right now that God is concerned with. He's going deeper than that. This is the heart of the churchgoer. The heart of the follower, if you will. The heart of the religious person. God is saying, religious people, listen up. He's already addressed the country. He will address the country again. He'll address the entire kingdom, but right now this is a message in front of the temple for those coming up to the temple. And I'm going to save these opening verses for more study on Sunday. But as we continue through the message, that's the opening foray here, and may we take these things to heart. Beginning in verse 17, picking up from there, do you not see? what they are doing in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. Now, this is by contrast. These are the people coming up to the temple. These are the worshipers. These are the the religious folk. Don't you see what they're doing at home, God says. See, God's not stuck in the barn. God isn't limited to the church building. He doesn't wait at the door saying, Okay, okay, so see you next week. Boy, they look so holy tonight. He knows exactly what's going on in the streets of Judea as he does in the streets of Oak Harbor, in the streets of Anacortes, in the streets of Coopville. He knows what's going on. Don't you see what they're doing, he says? Verse 18, the children gather wood and the fathers kindle the fire and the women knead dough to make cakes for the queen of heaven. And they pour out drink offerings to other gods in order to spite me. Jeremiah is going to refer to the queen of heaven five times. This is an issue the Lord raises with the people. The queen of heaven. He refers to the queen of heaven here in chapter 7, verse 18. Again, in chapter 44, verses 17, uh, 18, 19, and 25. Again, the queen of heaven really deals with her. She's been around a while, this Queen of Heaven. She's had many names across the arc of history. Probably the earliest name we believe that she had, a title that was worn by this woman who was named Semiramis. Semiramis. 
wife to Nimrod, builder of Babel. Nimrod was the first to introduce idolatry and pagan worship into the world. Even with the Tower of Babel being an edifice, a part of that whole thing. Semiramis being the wife of Nimrod. And there are all kinds of stories that actually tie into some of our holidays that I'm not going to mess with tonight. <laughs> the Romans called her Venus, this queen of heaven. The Greeks, Eros. The Egyptians refer to her as Isis. The Babylonians called her Ishtar. You, you've heard of the Ishtar Gate. And the Phoenician cultures called her Astarte or Ashtaroth. Ashtaroth, and that is the goddess being referred to here, the fertility goddess of Jeremiah's prophecy, referred to as, or by some, as the queen of heaven. And yet, in Christendom today, she's been cleaned up, virginized, and given another name. And her name is Mary. Oh, oh, not, not the humble Mary of Scripture, not the Mary chosen to be blessed by God as the vessel through which God would bring himself, would come into the world as Jesus. Not that Mary, another Mary. A Mary that has been lifted up. A Mary that has been deified. And you know what I'm talking about, obviously. No offense to humble Mary, but idolatry, remember, idolatry is placing anything or anyone ahead of or above God. That's idolatry. Dave Hunt, if you'd like to do some research into this and think this through, Dave Hunt wrote a book called A Woman Rides the Beast. I highly recommend it. It's a brave book. Where he goes into Revelation uh, chapter 2, Revelation chapter 17, talks about the woman riding the beast and what that might be and ties into and then spends chapter after chapter after chapter talking about the Roman church today. I mean, no offense to anyone who has that background. You're, you're, you're laughing That's because you know that there's probably going to be offense, but I don't mean it. Dave Hunt writes the following. Time magazine comments that according to modern popes, Mary is the queen of heaven. That's the title for Mary. The most recited Catholic prayer, the rosary, concludes with this final petition. Hail, Holy Queen of Heaven, Mother of Mercy. Our life, our sweetness, and our hope, to Thee do we cry. I recall Jesus saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but through me. Surely if Mary was another alternative, if Mary was another way to the Father, Jesus would have said so. What did Jesus actually say about Mary? Understand, the only queen of heaven ever mentioned in the Bible is Ashtaroth. There is no other title, queen of heaven, given to anybody else, only given to the goddess Ashtaroth. What did Jesus say about Mary? Matthew chapter 12, verse 47. Someone said to Jesus, Behold, your mother and your brothers are standing outside seeking to speak to you. Jesus answered the one who was telling him and said, Who's my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand toward his disciples, he said, Behold, my mother and my brothers. And then he said, Whoever does the will of my Father who is in heaven, he is my brother and sister and mother. He had opportunity right there to acknowledge Mary is the queen of heaven. And he didn't. How about Luke chapter 11, verse 27? One of the women in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts at which you nursed. But he said, on the contrary, blessed are those who hear the word of God and observe it. Again, give an opportunity to elevate Mary. And yet he won't. He doesn't. He never does. And for those who say, but, but I've followed Mary all of my life. I've trusted her all of my life. Well, I would encourage you to trust her just one more time and obey 100% the last words that we have recorded by her in Scripture. What does she say? John chapter 2, verse 5, whatever he says to you, do it. The Queen of Heaven. I can say authoritatively, there is no Queen of Heaven. There is only a King. And his name is Jesus. Chapter 7, verse 20, going on. 
Therefore, thus says the Lord God, as, as the people are doing this worship, this queen of heaven worship, this worship of Ashtaroth or Astarte. Therefore, behold, my anger and my wrath will be poured out on this place, on man and on beast and on the trees of the field and on the fruit of the ground, and it will burn and not be quenched. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, add to your burnt offerings, to your sacrifices, and eat flesh. For I did not speak to your fathers or command them in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt concerning burnt offerings and sacrifices. This is what I commanded them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and you will be my people. And you will walk in all the way which I have commanded you, and it, that it may be well with you. The Lord says, look, go back to Sinai. And you can do that. Back to Exodus 19. Actually, just go back and read the whole book of Exodus. What is the focus of the Father? He tells us right here, my focus was not on sacrifice and law. My focus was on relationship and obedience. I will be your God. You be my people. Now, there are those who say this section, these few verses, invalidates the sacrificial system. There are some liberal scholars who say, well, see, he says that he wasn't about the burnt offerings. And actually, maybe those didn't even come up until way after Moses. Those were added in later. And even Moses probably didn't write Torah. And all that stuff is bunk. And there are those who try to teach and believe that based just on these few verses. That's not what God is saying. What he's saying, if I may paraphrase this, is... You might as well eat the flesh of your sacrifices yourselves for all the good it will do you. He says, you're missing the point. The sacrifice is to reveal to you how lost you are, how badly you need blood. But the sacrifices are not to replace me. The sacrifices are not to get in the way of relationship. The practice of religion cannot get you to where I am. Well, what then, Lord? Relationship. Obedience. My presence being about the things that I'm about. And that's the issue here. The people are bringing their sacrifices, but their faith is in the sacrifice rather than in the Lord. I'll give you a modern day example. Communion. Is your faith in communion? Or is it in the one communion represents? Baptism. Is your faith in water baptism? Or is it in what the water baptism represents? The one to whom we're called, the one who cleanses us, the one who washes us. The church. Is your faith in the church? Or are you gathered as part of the church because you have faith in the one to whom we worship? And God's saying, you've got it all messed up, Israel. Verse 24, yet they did not obey or incline their ear, but they walked in their own counsels and in the stubbornness of their evil heart and went backward and not forward. Okay, backward from Mount Sinai would be where? Egypt. Idolatry. Back to the old ways. Since the day that your fathers came out of the land of Egypt until this day, I have sent you all my servants, the prophets, daily rising early and sending them. Yet they did not listen to me or incline their ear, but stiffened their neck, and they did more evil than their fathers. You went backward, not forward. See, the thing is, it's getting the cart before the horse, rules before relationship. When religion precedes your relationship with God, it's backward. Religion's not a bad thing. Did you know that? Rules are not a bad idea. Things that keep us on the straight and narrow, that keep us on the path, not bad things, but they they should flow. Obedience flows out of relationship first. When we flip the two over and it becomes about the rules, relationship gets lost. You can't see the relationship for the rules. God says you've got it upside down. The way of the God follower must be worship first, relationship first, sacrifice second. Ministry out of relationship. Service because I'm in relationship. Psalm 51, David got it right. You do not delight in sacrifice, otherwise I would give it. You're not pleased with burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, you will not despise. 
By your favor, do good to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem, he says. And then you will delight in righteous sacrifices, in burnt offering, in whole burnt offering. Then young bulls will be offered on your altar. When? When we come first in humility and in contrite spirit. Bowing before the Lord in relationship. He doesn't reject the value or the importance of the sacrifice or the ministry or the service or the offering. What he rejects is when these things are emptied of their purpose. Their purpose is worship. Their purpose is intimacy. Their purpose is to come be in his presence. You know, of the sacrifices, the thank offering. We studied this when we were in Leviticus. The example of of the thank offering is great. God says, bring the thank offering, offer it, and stay and eat it with me. Let's have a barbecue together. God says, you know, let's picnic together. You stay there in the temple court. You have to eat that particular offering. You have to eat it right here. Why? So you're in my presence. So we dine together. Because it's all about relationship. Our worship is never about appeasing God. That's what idol worship was about. Appease the idols. Sacrifice to Molech. Do what must be done to appease the gods and their anger. Our our worship is not about appeasing God. It's not about appeasing His wrath. Christ did that on the cross. Our worship, our service is about intimacy. It's about presence. It's about experiencing Him. Being with Him. And that's why Jesus told the woman at the well, John 4, 23... An hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For such people, the Father seeks to be His worshipers. God is spirit. Those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. Verse 27, God says to Jeremiah, You shall speak all these words to them, but they will not listen to you. And you shall call to them, but they will not answer you. You shall say to them, This is the nation that did not obey the voice of the Lord their God or accept correction. Truth has perished and has been cut off from their mouth. And that's what happens. Truth first perishes. And then it is cut off from our mouths. What do you mean? When temple becomes the idol. When the church becomes our idol. Truth is unnecessary. You understand what I'm saying? If going to church saves me, who cares what's being preached? Who cares what the message is? Who cares if it's the Bible or some form of pop psychology or some book that some guy wrote? Who cares? Because I'm at church. If the liturgy is what saves me, who cares what the liturgy is? I don't care as long as I'm at church. As long as I can say before God when I die, well, I was at church. I was a church goer. Who cares what the truth is? I identify with this fellowship. I go to that church. I have a long history in this particular denomination. And so the church becomes the Savior and the truth becomes irrelevant. It's unnecessary. I was talking with Brian uh, on Tuesday, yesterday. And we were talking about our charge. Brian shared on Sunday. He's he's getting ready to plant a church. We're going to send him out. We don't know where. We're just going to send him. I think we're going to buy him like a pup tent, and he and Irene are just going to go. (laughs) We're waiting on the Lord to see where Brian's going to go. Listen to Brian's charge. This is my charge, and I take this very seriously. 2 Timothy 4, verse 2. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. And listen to these words, brothers and sisters. It's not my word. It's God's word. Reprove. Rebuke. Exhort. With great patience and instruction. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. And Brian shared, and rightly so on Sunday, there are times where I've said, I just sometimes hate teaching. It's not that I hate it. You know, it's that it's hard. Because I know the word is going to bring a rebuke. Sometimes, I'm aware the word is going to bring a rebuke to someone personally. Because I know what's going on in their life, and I know what the word says. It's like, uh, 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 okay, but I gotta, I gotta, I gotta preach the word. And sometimes it hurts to hear, and sometimes it is hard to hear. But listen, the reason why the truth has been cut off from their mouth is that it had already long before been cut off from their ears, and you cannot speak what you're not hearing. 
Faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the Word of Christ. Right? we got to hear the truth. We've got to be in the truth. The temple goers of Judah were in bad shape because of their disobedience. They not only couldn't hear the truth anymore, but now they can't even speak the truth. And it goes from bad to worse. Verse 29. Cut off your hair and cast it away. And take up a lamentation on the bare heights. For the Lord has rejected and forsaken the generation of His wrath. Now we got to pause and look at this one verse. To cut off the hair, the obvious sense of this is to cut off the hair was a sign of deep mourning. Which means the older I'm getting, I guess the more in mourning I am. I'm not sure. <laughs> to cut off the hair. I'm in mourning. I'm, I'm in sorrow. But there's more going on here than simply a lament. The root word for hair there in the Hebrew is nazar. Nazar. It means the crown of the head. Okay, so cut off the crown, you could say. Which would make sense because he's talking about Judah. He's talking about Jerusalem. It's going to be trashed. The crown of Judah is about to be cut off. And Jeremiah, I want you physically to cut your hair off as a sign, as a symbol to the people of Jerusalem and of Judah that the crown is about to be cut off. And a sign of your lamentation, which he will do. But this root word, Nazar, has another meaning, and you will be familiar with this. The meaning of the word is consecration. Consecration. You see, there was an act among the Jewish people of self-consecration, of a man or a woman consecrating themselves completely to the Lord for life. It was a vow that they could take. Do you know what vow I'm talking about? The Nazarite vow, not Tsar. Consecration, the consecrating vow, the Nazarite vow. Samson made the Nazarite vow. We believe John the Baptist also lived by the Nazarite vow. And it involved, first off, no drinking at all, not even grape juice. Couldn't even have a grape knee high. That would be out. And Numbers chapter 6, verse 5 says, All the days of his vow of separation, no razor shall pass over his head. He shall be holy until the days are fulfilled for which he separated himself to the Lord. He shall let the locks of hair on his head grow long. Listen, God viewed Jerusalem, viewed the temple as consecrated to himself. But now that consecration is over. Cut the hair. Cut the hair. There's no more consecration. This house will no longer stand as the house of my name. It's about to be cut off. Verse 30, For the sons of Judah have done that which is evil in my sight, declares the Lord. They have set their detestable things in the house, which is called by my name to defile it. What does that mean? That there were idols in the temple. Unbelievable. They have built the high places of Tophet, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to burn their sons and daughters in the fire, which I did not command, and it did not come to mind. And you Bible students know this is Molech worship. Molech worship happened in the valley of Hinnom, the Hinnom Valley, Gehenna, Jesus would later refer to as the valley of burning. Now by Jesus' day, it was a trash dump. And so there would be smoldering, burning trash in the valley of Hinnom. But Jesus knew this before that. The valley of burning was of the burning of infants. On the idol of Molech, which was a great iron furnace. And this would happen in the Hanam Valley. It was also called Tophet. Tophet, which means drumming. Because as the sacrifices to Molech were being given, drums were beaten, loud, thudding drums, to drown out the cries, the shrieks of the dying babies that were being offered up to Molech. And therefore, verse 32, Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord. Oh, and by the way, let me just say this. These, these things went on in the days of King Manasseh, father to Josiah. Josiah came around and, and, and kind of straightened things out a bit. But then his sons went and did the same thing. Brought it right back. So much for revival. Therefore, behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when it will no longer be called Tophet, or the valley of the son of Hanam, but the valley of the slaughter, for they will bury in Tophet because there's no other place. The dead bodies of this people will be food for the birds of the sky and for the beasts of the earth, and no one will frighten them away. 
By the way, the Lord warned, warned of this very thing over nine centuries earlier on Mount Ebal. You may recall the story, Deuteronomy chapter 27 and 28. On Mount Ebal, half of the people of Israel stood. On Mount Gerizim, the other half of the people stood. I stood on Mount Gerizim last time we were in Israel, just this last year, and it was amazing because you can look right across and there's a deep valley in between the two mountains. Moses stood in the valley. Half the people on Mount Ebal on the other side, half on Mount Gerizim, and the whole thing's like a great amphitheater. Moses stood in the middle, and in Deuteronomy 27 and 28, he calls out blessings. And every time he calls out a blessing, all the people gathered on Mount Gerizim say, Amen! Yes, Lord! And when he calls out curses, all the people gathered on Mount Ebal say, Yes, Lord, Amen, we accept this. We accept the contract. Of blessing and cursing. I use that with my kids all the time. I do. Do you want Mount Gerizim or do you want Mount Ebal here? Which mountain do you want to stand on? Blessing and cursing. You make the right choices. You're on Mount Gerizim. You make the wrong choices. It's Mount Ebal. And the Lord said in Deuteronomy 28 verse 26, Your carcasses will be food to all the birds of the sky and to the beasts of the earth, and there will be no one to frighten them away. 900 years earlier God said that. And now, through the prophet Jeremiah, he's saying in verse 33, the dead bodies of this people will be for food, for the birds of the sky, for the beasts of the earth, and no one will frighten them away. And by by the way, that same thing is spoken over Armageddon in Revelation 19. That the flesh of the rebellious will be food for the birds of the air. Come for the great supper of the Lord, he calls out to all the birds of the air. Come down and feed on the flesh of the fallen. Verse 34, then I will make to cease from the cities of Judah and from the streets of Jerusalem the voice of joy and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom, the voice of the bride. The land will become a ruin. Verse 1 of chapter 8, at that time declares the Lord, they will bring out the bones of the kings of Judah and the bones of its princes and the bones of the priests and the bones of the prophets, and the bones of the inhabitants of Jerusalem from their graves. Watch this. They, that is Babylon, will spread them out to the sun, the moon, and to all the host of heaven, which they, that is Judah, which they have loved, and which they have served, and which they have gone after, and which they have sought, and which they have worshipped. And they will not be gathered or buried. They will be as dung on the face of the ground. And death will be chosen rather than life. By all the remnant that remains of this evil family, that remains in all the places to which I have driven them, declares the Lord of hosts. What's up with the bones? In the ancient world, the highest form of humiliation is for the dead to be left unburied. If you kill someone in battle and they'll leave the body strewn out on the ground, if you kill someone in an invasion, the bodies of the people of Jerusalem and of Judah, and if you just leave them out in the open in the, to rot in the heat, it's humiliating. Even more so to go and exhume the bones of previous kings and rulers of Judah and throw those out, strewn those out all over the ground, to bake under the hot sun. It was an act of deep humiliation and Babylon did it. The bones of the leaders were exhumed to bake in the sun. And this is what happens. You know, I'm thinking ahead. We're going to get to Ezekiel eventually or the Lord's going to come, whichever is first. Probably more likely. But in Ezekiel, remember the vision Ezekiel is given? The valley of the dry bones. And in this case, bones are taken out and they're spread about And Jeremiah has been talking about this throughout. The Lord has been calling out the princes and the kings and the priests and the prophets of Judah who are all leading the people the wrong direction. And there's an interesting picture here. Because for a leader, a spiritual leader, to lead people the wrong direction is for them to be nothing but bones. There's no flesh. There's no life. A spiritual leader who is led by the Holy Spirit, who is worshiping in spirit and in truth, Well, that's a fellowship where there's flesh on the bones and life in the bodies and hearts beating and people pursuing the Lord. And I don't want us to be like these people. Spiritually speaking, just bodies strewn about, bones of the leaders drying and baking in the hot sun. 
We need the living water of the Holy Spirit to keep us fresh and refreshed and restored and alive. Amen? Amen. And so we want to walk by that. Verse 4, he continues on now. You shall say to them, thus says the Lord, Do men fall and not get up again? Does one turn away and not repent? Why then has this people Jerusalem turned away in continual apostasy? They hold fast to deceit. They refuse to return. And what's remarkable in all of this is God keeps giving them opportunity to return, opportunity to repent, even after He says they won't repent, and judgment is definite, and this is going to happen, Babylon is going to wipe out, but He keeps saying, but repent. But repent. Well, Lord, if they're not going to repent, why do you keep saying it? Because that's His heart. The heart of the Father is always, turn around to me. Even if the heart of the people is cold and dead and lifeless. Verse 6, I have listened and heard they have spoken what is not right. No man repented of his wickedness, saying, what have I done? Everyone turned to his course like a horse, charging into battle, sinning boldly, I said recently. They're just charging ahead, as though they're going to win a war. He says, even the stork in the sky knows her season. And the turtle dove and the swift and the thrush observe the time of their migration, but my people do not know the ordinance of the Lord. How can you say we are wise and the law of the Lord is with us? But behold, the lying pen of the scribes has made it into a lie. What's that sound like to you? Gang, this is the scriptures being rewritten. Uh, perhaps lines in Scripture being lined through or not copied over because, wow, that's too harsh for the people. We need to change that to make it more palatable. Paraphrasing Scripture to make it sound nice where it's convicting. The wise men are put to shame, he says. They are dismayed and caught. Behold, they have rejected the word of the Lord. And what kind of wisdom do they have? The Bible scholars of these days of Judah's days, were manipulating the message. Thinking themselves wise. Warning. We think ourselves wise when we put pen to the page. And we do it with our literature and our devotional books and our commentaries and our blogs and our Facebook postings. And we think, oh, how wise am I? Careful. Be careful when you put your pen to the page. Watch out for a wisdom that does not come down from above. Because the wisdom of man is not something worth living by. But only the wisdom that comes down from above. James talks about that, James chapter 3. And if you're really pursuing, seeking, wanting to understand wisdom, I highly recommend you just study James 3. And the wisdom that comes down from above and what that looks like, how it's different than the wisdom which is demonic and earthly and of the flesh. Even the birds, he says back in verse 7, even the birds know better. They know better than you guys. He mentions the stork, the dove, the swift, and the thrush. And these birds know better about their migratory patterns. Instinctually, they know better about God's ways than his own people do. Annually, these birds would come back into the land of Judea. Annually, the people would see their return. How do the birds know? I never understood that. You know? The swallows returning returning to Capistrano. How do they know? I would get lost every time, flapping my little wings, just trying, you know, but they just know. They go straight to it. They know better. And God is making a parallel here saying, they know instinctually by migration. They know to migrate back to the land. Do you? Do I know instinctually to follow the Lord? To walk His path, to fly the way that He calls me to fly. I love Isaiah's take on the same thing. He says in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 3, An ox knows its owner, and a donkey its master's manger, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. Isaiah and Jeremiah nail it. Sometimes dumb animals and bird brains know better how to follow the Lord than we do. <laughs> they understand more. They just do what they were created to do. Hey, we were created to worship. So let's do what we're created to do and we will migrate to the right place if we're worshiping the Lord. Verse 10, chapter 8, continuing on. See how fast we're moving? Verse 10. Therefore I will give their wives to others, their fields to new owners. 
Because from the least even to the greatest, everyone is greedy for gain. From the prophet even to the priest, everyone practices deceit. They heal the brokenness of the daughter of my people superficially. We read this last week. Saying, peace, peace, but there is no peace. These are the false prophets saying, look, the temple's standing. Therefore, God is with us. Therefore, we'll, be ha- we'll have peace. They can't touch us. Yeah, but he, he allowed all of northern Israel to be wiped out. Yeah, but they didn't have the temple. See, we do. We have Jerusalem. We've got the crown. We'll be at peace. And the prophets... Other than Jeremiah and Hosea and Amos, the prophets are prophesying peace. It's all right. Don't worry about it. We got the temple. It was idolatry. And that was at issue here. It was idolatry. Were they ashamed because of the abomination they had done? Verse 12. They certainly were not ashamed. And they did not know how to blush. This is now the second time Jeremiah has said this. Or the Lord has. They don't even know how to blush anymore. Nothing offends them. Nothing embarrasses them. Therefore, they shall fall among those who fall. At the time of their punishment, they shall be brought down, says the Lord. I will surely snatch them away, declares the Lord. And listen to this. There will be no grapes on the vine and no figs on the fig tree. And the leaf will wither. And what I have given them will pass Away, Israel is most often compared to two different plants in the scripture, the vine and the fig tree. And you'll see this over and over in the Hebrew scriptures, the vine and the fig tree. Hosea chapter 9 verse 10, I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. I saw your forefathers as the earliest fruit on the fig tree in its first season. Joel chapter 1 verse 7, talking about another invading nation, probably Rome, says, it has made my vine a waste and my fig tree splinters. It has stripped them bare and cast them away. Their branches have become white. That's what the deer have been doing to my landscaping, but let's not talk about that right now. (laughs) The point is, as America has the eagle and Russia has the bear, Canada has the maple leaf, France has the french fries, just like all of these things, (laughs) Israel has the fig tree. Israel has the fig tree, and the fig tree symbolizes Israel. And so when Jesus says, Matthew 24, 32, learn the parable from the fig tree, what is he talking about? Israel. Learn the parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth its leaves, you know summer is near. So you too, when you see all these things, recognize he is near right at the door. Second coming of Jesus. The fig tree becomes tender again. The fig tree begins to produce again. The branches are green and tender. Israel, back to life. You see, as Joel is speaking of the invasion of Rome and the stripping of the fig tree, A.D. 70, the wiping out of that. So it would happen. But Jesus says, learn the parable because the fig tree is going to blossom again. And when it does... You know the summer is near. You know he is right at the door. 1948. May 14th. You Bible students, you know the date. We've been over this. Israel became a nation again. June 1967. Israel, for the first time since A.D. 70, has sovereignty over Jerusalem again. January 2013. Benjamin Netanyahu was re-elected Prime Minister of Israel. Yay! Yay! (laughs) <laughs> and there is a strong there is strong support even from some of the other I won't get into the politics of this right now but, but even from the uh, opposition parties that Netanyahu now has to create a coalition to make the government function but there is very strong support throughout the Knesset there in Israel to never divide Jerusalem gang the fig tree is ripe it's green we're close 